I was not given much chance of succeeding because they because I didn't fit into any category. Film Institute those days was a star producing factory. You were chosen because you were either hero potential or villain potential or comedian potential. Yeah. <laughs> I was none <laughs> of these. <laughs> So finally it's time to release one of the most anticipated videos on our channel our episode with Mr Nasiruddin Shah Nasir sir is one of the finest and the most legendary actors of Indian cinema Nasir sir ne ek memoir bhi likha tha and then one day jiske bare mein maine aur Vani ne unse baat ki uske alawa bhi we took a lot of recommendations from him his favorite books short films playwrights a lot of recommendations are coming your way also if you are new to the channel Don't forget to click on the subscribe button. We are about to cross 100k subscribers. So now it's time to jump right inside the conversation Vani and I had with Mr. Nasiruddin Shah. Hi Nasir sir, how are you? Welcome to Jalchitra Talks. Thanks very much. Since yesterday Vani and I have been going through your book again. One thing that like I really liked in the start itself is basically the dedication that is there in the book where you have dedicated this book to dula bai and appa bai who might find who might have finally uh, understood i really like the dedication and like uh, we ask this question to our guests all the time which are some of your favorite dedications from any of the books that you like there's one by pg woodhouse who is one of my favorite writers where he says to my daughter honoria with whose help it would never have been written <laughs> but, but she is the queen of her species so we also want to know about uh, about your favorite uh, biographies or memoirs i haven't read too many because i got put off i read a few actors biographies and autobiographies and they didn't interest me Uh, at all because it's kind of self glorification and i think a lot of them are written for that reason uh, or to rectify gossip about them or things that are supposedly famous about notor- they are notorious about the one that i was very affected by was anthony quinn's autobiography he's always been one of my favorite actors i read it in college it's called the original sin i found that very modest he's not necessarily honest or honorable but he's straight about it Later after that I read Peter O'Toole's uh, autobiography which is called Loitering with Intent. <laughs> I love that title. Nice. <laughs> it's mainly a description of his of his childhood <laughs> and it's extremely funny and uh, it has that that body Irish humor uh, and a sort of devil may care attitude which Peter O'Toole personifies on screen. So these were the two I really loved. I did try reading Marlon Brando who's another great actor yeah. of one of the greatest mm-hmm. and I didn't quite enjoy it there was too much of boasting about how he did things so I'm afraid I haven't read too many autobiographies I think the most fascinating one as I've written in my book is by Neville Cardus who was a great uh, music critic and a cricket writer and cricket lover one of the autobiographies which have had a big impact on my life is Elia Kazan's autobiography called yes. A Life Yes, yeah. yes. In fact, somebody gave me that book last year. I was really very moved by some of the uh, the pieces, and uh, it's worth listening to whatever Ilya Kazan has to say because he was put into a very uncomfortable position. Yeah, and I think he handled it with grace. So yeah. I was very really interested in um, in knowing about that. And as for Indian actors, or <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's there's nothing to say. <laughs> So autobiographies have not been my uh, my my cup of tea really. I have to admit that as a child I was uh, hooked by comics. I used to read the series of books of a character called Billy Bunter. They were adventure stories and Billy Bunter was a funny it was like it was set in a public school uh, and I was in a in a convent boarding school myself in Nainital. and reminded me greatly of the school we are in and the fact that he can look at this situation which i considered rather harsh and cruel uh, you know with a sense of humor right and he actually made that life kind of seem kind of enjoyable then there was a writer called richmond crompton who wrote a book, series of books on a character called william which i also loved but that was the limit of my reading in school i didn't bother <laughs> with the physics and chemistry books <laughs> all the geography books is stuff i regret now uh, mathematics was a nightmare for me in the newspapers i would look at rk lakshman's you said it and i'd skip straight to the sports page and read about cricket news or or news about boxing to the two 
sport I was interested in. It was only later, and thanks to my elder brother's influence, not influence, it wasn't conscious because he would come home every year from school and I'd bring my stack of comics and this magazine called Sport and Pastime and he would always bring a book or two. It was either Woodhouse or Somerset Moham or Agatha Christie. So gradually I began to, out of curiosity, pick up these books and start reading them. Agatha Christie, of course, was very exciting, but it took me a while to begin to appreciate Somerset Moham. And now I consider him one of the writers I would read at any time. And the Reader's Digest. Nice, yeah. yeah. My dad used to say, why do you read these bloody comics? I'll give you something worth. Come on, read, read Reader's Digest. And he used to say, oh, these comics will spoil your English. Uh, yeah. And he was, he was totally wrong there, you know. Because of comics, I found out about stories like Tale of Two Cities and Robin Hood and uh, Moby Dick and Don Quixote. I hadn't read the comic of Don Quixote. So I used to think, what is this name? Quixote, what does this mean? And there's this picture of a man on a horse charging at a windmill. But I never got hold of that. Years and years later, I discovered about Don Quixote. Um, uh, and dad never realized that reading these uh, pictorial stories are arousing my curiosity to one day read these books. Yeah. And that's what exactly what happened uh, when I was in college. Because, hey, David Copperfield, I've seen the movie. Movies were another thing which, which, which captivated me very early. Yeah. Um, as I've written in the book, that we, yeah. we were allowed to see a lot of movies, English movies, yeah. or Dilip Kumar's movies. And my dad never saw movies, my mom never saw movies, but we were allowed to watch them. So I've watched any number of movies from the ages of three to five. And at five, I went into boarding school, and in school too, they showed us movies. Every week, they showed us a movie. And the range was fantastic. I'd seen classics like On the Waterfront and High Noon and Moby Dick and Citizen Kane, along with Laurel and Hardy and Tom and Jerry. It was absolutely magical world. That and the theatre. Nice. Uh, the plays that the school did, the visiting troops like Shakespeareana, which I've written in detail about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these things really, I think, formed my tastes and, and choices. And that is why I have such a a fondness for uh, good speech, uh, well-told stories, and uh, high drama and comedy. I love them all. But I have to say that the book which perhaps had the deepest influence on me was something I read when I was in the drama school, and that was Jonathan Livingstone Seagull. I read it through in one sitting, and it affected me. I do not know why. I identified with it, of course. I mean, that's the obvious thing, but... Uh, there was something more that it seemed to be telling me. Uh, and and I've kind of followed that path. I haven't yet reached the planet with two sons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the music of the 70s, yeah. which is still immortal and which the kids of today even love. Yeah. My children love it. Any school I go to, I, mean, I, I hear them talking of Pink Floyd. I want to go a little deeper into like all these... Uh, genres that we have, the books and the movies and the music. Let's say if you're reading a Japanese author, let's say if you're reading Murakami, the faces and the images that form in your head, are they Japanese people? Like if you are thinking of a protagonist, is that a Japanese person? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now, this is a mistake I used to make at, uh, earlier that I used to concentrate only on the characterizations. When I was watching a movie, I'd watch only the acting and nothing else. When I read a thing like Copperfield, the beauty of the writing escaped me. It was while really reading it that I began to imagine uh, myself as most of the characters. Ah. <laughs> but that's a tough question because uh, if I'm reading Khalil Gibran, I don't know what to imagine. When I read The Fountainhead in college, all girls gave it to their boyfriends. And they, <laughs> they remind me of Howard Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw myself there. I didn't know whether this person is American or, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know what nationality. It didn't matter. It's what the character personified. Unless, of course, you're reading something like Conan Doyle and there's Holmes or there's Poirot. Then he's described so beautifully right. that you cannot help but imagine him. 
another thing that i do like uh, like uh, like while reading a book is let's say if the author has written there is beautiful daylight out there and like the scene is going in day 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 and suddenly they make it start raining and i'm like i don't want to imagine it raining right now so sometimes i don't bring rain into the picture i change okay then or any me to raat imagine karunga so have you ever done these modifications while reading a book <laughs> yeah sure I, i think we all do it Or, or I'd imagine rain and sunshine together. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that's a beautiful sight. <laughs> But yeah. There, yeah, there are often times when, when I feel, ki, why? Why exactly? Why talk about the the breeze blowing gently through her hair? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm more interested in her hair than the breeze. <laughs> So Weber and I were discussing again, and then one day yesterday, and we were discussing how we would really, really want to know if you are really going to rework on it and add a few more chapters. No, because it's complete in itself. Uh, I'm I'm asked, and it's, it feels very good to be asked if I'm writing a sequel to it. I'm not writing a sequel to it, but I am write, trying to write something. I, I write very slowly, and I always revise a million times. You know, like like I do when I act. So what I'm writing is. Uh, is not going to be in the first person it's going to be wow. yeah it's going to be experiences i had uh, in this film industry uh, and and about the dreams i had but it won't be i it'll be he the names will be thinly disguised uh, so you'll be able to tell who i'm talking about but then i needn't fear any uh, you know unpleasant backlash because this this film industry is, is an unreal place <laughs> I'm often surprised that I've I've survived nearly 50 years in it. It makes Fellini sound tame, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's really unreal. And there's so many fascinating things that have happened to me, not gossipy things because that's not an aspect I'm interested in. Um, but the interplay of the wheels within wheels that go on the Secret ambitions of actors, and I had some, and I've observed them in others. So it'll be about that. It'll be, it'll be, let's say, it'll be the the parts I left out <laughs> in then one, day. and when you read it, which maybe a few years from now, I don't know. Then one day it took me twelve years to write, and wow. I didn't write it. Yeah, I never thought it would become a book. Honestly, I I was shooting this Hollywood film in Prague. And I've written that in the introduction. I was making so much money, I didn't know what to do with. It. So I bought a computer and learned how to use it. And then I said, "Well, now what do I do with it?" But I discovered this this word thing, and someone told me how to type. So I started typing, and I said, "Let me type." So I just typed what I remembered, uh, or, or things I'd been told, or things that had happened, which I maybe hadn't seen, but things which had happened in my family. And then I I gave it up after about a couple of months, and then resumed it after a year. Uh, that would be something interesting to talk about. Hey, that was very funny. That etc. That's how it happened. I never thought it'd be a book. I'm very glad that it has turned out to be a book, and people like you have read it. Nice. Currently, uh, what's your relationship with writing? Do, are you a disciplined writer, or do you only write when the inspiration hits? I need to know what I'm writing about. I can't write um, uh, for the sake of it. Like Guzar Bhai, for example, this is a very interesting story. Guzar Bhai, about a year ago, fractured his thumb playing tennis, and he always writes with a pen. He doesn't write; he uses a computer. In him, the the urge to write just arises, the need to write arises, and he can always think of the right words. And he told me that there was a time uh, um, uh, in his career when he was unwanted, when he made a film or two which hadn't done very well. and no one wanted him as as a filmmaker or as a, a lyricist or as a screenplay writer or as anything and he said this phase lasted about 3 years and he says despite that i used to go to my office every morning at 9 he wakes up at 4 and he says i used to sit at my desk and write till lunch time so I said, what did you write he said i used to write anything and if i hadn't done that i would have gone mad I would have given in to despair. I haven't been three years without work, uh, but I do know that in, in that in times when I'm between jobs, uh, and there have been phases, there's been sometimes a year long. I did constantly feel the urge to perform, so I would read things to myself. It was the equivalent of what Gulzar Bhai did. 
but I don't feel the urge to write. I write only if I uh, if there's something that I feel I should say. It's important to say it, and if I can find the right words, and it takes me a while each time. Have you also uh, found pockets of stillness, like things you go back to every time you feel distressed? I go back to my work. Okay. That's the only thing which you know which heals. I suffer from an ailment called onomatopoeia. It's a, it's, it's. A, I'm not joking. It's a, it's a medical condition. Okay. You can check it in the dictionary. Onomatopoeia is an ailment in which you keep repeating a word or a phrase or a sentence or a verse or an entire speech for no reason at all, except that you you like to hear it. I do that uh, all the time. So, so, so I'm never quite addressed. In fact, even when I'm sleeping, I'm going over some passage I love. Oh. Yeah, uh, if I'm not reading and, and I fall asleep while reading, but I, I like to go over it. Continuing with Vani's question, uh, she asked about pockets of stillness. Like I really like this uh, writer. Her name is Maria Bopova. She has this blog called Brain Pickings where she has written like identify the things that magnify your spirit. I'm sure acting is one. But apart from acting, who are the people, the places, the things which magnify your spirit? My family, first of all, the uh, they are of course dearest to me, uh, and I would I would do anything for them. And then the young actors I work with, nice. They are people who I love deeply, and uh, I hate to call it teaching. It sounds very pompous. I like to call it helping, <laughs> helping actors. And I've been doing it for almost 30 years now, and I, I've rectified the initial mistakes I made. You know, one does tend to emulate uh, people one has seen when one is younger until you, you're finally happy in your own skin. And that happened to me when I was about 50. Before that, I was a pretty ill-adjusted person. Yeah. But the, the young actors, they really make me feel young again, and they make me feel very happy when I, particularly when I get them to... Uh, to achieve their potential. I don't teach them the uh, the externals of acting because, you know, one learns them on one's own. I try to teach them the nuts and bolts, okay. what constructs your performance. And it's wonderful to see them flowering. And there are several I've worked with over many years now. There was two years I spent at Subhash Gai's school, Whistling Woods. I spent my entire time there. I didn't do any acting at that time. Uh, I just worked with these students and at least 10 of them uh, are still in my theatre company. This is really saying something that I enjoy that more than I enjoy acting myself. At times I find acting rather fatiguing, you know, particularly mm -hmm. film acting. Mm -hmm. Then I recall a statement by the great Charles Lawton, British actor who one day fed up of waiting in his makeup room and was about to blow his fuse. And then said to himself, but this is what they pay me for. I do the acting for free. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to books, like uh, do Ratna ma'am and you have like similar tastes? Because I remember from her episode, like she told us she is also a fan of PG Woodhouse. But in general, how similar are your likings? If I like something, I pass it on to her and vice versa. Um, but we don't always read the books we pass on to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Our taste in movies differs also. She likes soppy family dramas and I can't stand them. Uh, <laughs> but I've managed to twist her arm and get her to watch the stuff I like. She didn't like Harry Belafonte until I forced her to listen to him. Yeah, so I take credit for that. Uh, I take credit for her, her fondness for cricket. In the early days, there was one black and white channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very rainy, snow kept falling all the time. But I used to watch uh, test matches because there'd be maybe one or two test matches a year. I'd tell her, come on, you've got to watch this. And she'd say, how can you find every single ball of every shot? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, she couldn't quite understand that, but she does watch and she has begun to understand a little bit about cricket now. The thing that we have in common in movies is comedies. We both like comedies. We both think that Charles Chaplin was the greatest ever actor. And I make it a point to tell all actors that. He was sent by God to show all actors what it's possible to do and what you will never be able to. <laughs> 
So that's what we agree on. At the moment, uh, I, I've discovered uh, Evelyn Waugh, who was an early 20th century writer. On Woodhouse's books, there was always a comment by Evelyn Waugh, but I never read his stuff until I did a film um, last year, uh, for which I had one day's work, and they said, you, you know, we can't afford to. So I said, forget about payment, just buy me a set of Evelyn Waugh's books. <laughs> and they did. And so I have an entire set, and I started reading him, and he's just fantastic. He's absolutely fantastic. He writes about the same world as Woodhouse writes about, yeah. uh, but without the affection. He's got a very cynical take on it, uh, and his writing is so elegant. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. We both like Asterix comics. We both like Tintin comics. And we like talking about things we've read. I'm a big fan of your movie made by Adhiraj, Interior Cafe Night. Like, I yeah. really like that. It's a great short film. Are there any, any short films that you saw over these years that stayed with you? Yes, at the Institute. Norman McLaren is a Canadian filmmaker. I saw a film called Incident at Owl Creek. I don't know who made it. I saw short films made by Martin Scorsese, who was not a known name then. And then we were shown a film called Duel, which is Steven Spielberg's first film, which he made just after he finished film school, and which is one of his best, I think. And there was a short film of about uh, two minutes, which I found extremely powerful, which shows empty streets, newspapers flapping in the wind, cars parked on the sidewalk, but you don't see any sign of life. You see windows open, you see clothing drying, but you don't see a car moving, you don't see a person moving. And the camera just travels through these empty streets, through shops which are open, with their goods displayed. And the camera travels further and further and further until it comes to a big office building, which looks like a government building. And it goes into the building, it's all one shot, and goes up the steps and goes into this office where there's what we used to call a, a, a teleprinter. Those days there was no fax or there was no email, which was a thing you could type out and a message would re reach immediately, faster than a telegram. And the teleprinter says, there's a new bomb. The United States is trying out this morning, which will destroy all living beings, but will not affect immobile things. Wow. <laughs> yeah. What's uh, the name of this short film again? It's called Skiddo, S-K-I-D-D-O, Skiddo, 80 or 82 or something like that. But you can surely get it on YouTube. Nice. And nice. that I said, wow, man, this blew my mind because I said, if in two minutes you can make a statement like this, then oof, cinema, does cinema have possibilities? And while I was at the, at the Institute, uh, where there were 22 of us, in the class. Only two have survived. <laughs> and the two are Shakti Kapoor and myself. Difficult to believe, but yeah, we attended the same classes. <laughs> we heard the same lectures. <laughs> we saw the same films. <laughs> we were taught the same things. <laughs> but he learned what he had to learn and I learned what I had to learn. I was not given much chance of succeeding because they because I didn't fit into any category. Film Institute those days was a star producing factory. There's a list of stars where none of you would have even been born when these guys became guys and girls became stars because they were from film institute and none of them lasted longer than a couple of years uh, i won't bother to go into names there are too many but the institute was that you were chosen because you were either hero potential or villain potential or comedian potential yeah. <laughs> i was none <laughs> of these <laughs> deep in my heart i knew i could fit into all three but no one else did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and, and I did, by seeing the films I saw, by the conversations I had with, uh, with other students, not with the acting students. And that's why I've developed this belief that acting is learned. It isn't taught. Mm -hmm. You've got to help a kid learn. You've got to open his mind. You've got to be kind. You've got to love him. You've got to give him a kick in the pants occasionally, but you have to love him. You know, and if he doesn't feel that, and he doesn't feel that you care, then there's no point telling him to read Stanislavski. <laughs> and nobody has yeah. read Stanislavski, by the way. In fact, I really loved the page where you had given a take on like how people are so obsessed with the Stanislavski method. Because while reading Kazan also, he had said the similar thing. While you try to remember those memories from the past, you're basically sleepwalking. That is not acting. That is <laughs> You're just in, in, wallowing in memories. Yeah. And, yeah. and for anybody, it'll work. 
I can yeah. start thinking of my mother and and, and I'll get moist eyed, you know, within seconds. Yeah. I still have her dupatta in my cupboard and I still, every time I see it, so I avoid looking at it. It affects me. So it's pointless. And that's yeah. what all acting students are made to do, unfortunately. Yeah. And how many times can you draw upon the same memory? You cannot. Apart from it not working, it just takes away the joy of the work. Because then, are you going to, okay, okay, let me think of that. No, you've got to create a new world every time. That's the joy. You yeah. can live so many imaginary lives, you know, without facing real life consequences, as someone yeah. said. And uh, that's really true. And unless you create something new every time, you're going to get bored with the job. And life has taught me that not acting books, and I find most books on acting rather boring, you know. Uh, they make acting sound like a rocket science, you know, It's uh, and it's not. It's something which you have to sort out yourself. No number of books can help you because they, they just make it sound so damn difficult. And after a certain stage, it is difficult, but but that, that difficulty has a, an ability to transmit energy. So are there many actors out there who just rely on that one singular memory for like entire like decades? These are the actors who get bored with their work by the time they're 40 years old. Damn. And there's so many of them I know. Many of them are my friends. Many of them who I've worked with many years, who I can see. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but the good life, you know, and the chitter chatter between shots and the, the bon homie after shooting, you know, and I never indulge in all this. That's why I'm considered strange. <laughs> That's what they all look forward to. The shot is something that has to be got over with as soon as possible. <laughs> These are people who have found no meaning in acting. Yeah. Um, apart from a way of making money. Okay. That's kind of sad. I also loved like how in the book you have written about the relationship between like theatre and an actor. So I also want to talk about which are your favourite playwright? Shakespeare, of course. Bernard Shaw, I'm very much in love with. I can't say I'm deeply in love with any others because I haven't read enough, extensively enough of any other writer. I've read all of Shakespeare and I've read almost all of Shaw. Arthur Miller, I think, is a great playwright. Okay. Tom Stoppard, I think, is a great playwright. I think it qualifies you to be called great if you've written three or four great plays, you know. And that's why Shakespeare stands above them all. Because he's written 32, you know. And some of them are really bad. Like like, like reading a bad Hindi film script, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but there are at least 20 which are better than anything that's ever been written by anybody else. But I'm sure who detested Shakespeare, or at least claimed to, because he said Shakespeare has no worldview. Oh. Shakespeare is not political. I can't contest what Shaw said. But because of this statement, I began to read Shaw. And, and he's fascinating because, because Shaw never tells you just a story of thwarted love or ambition or anything like that. You know, He's always got a, a deeper political agenda in what he, he makes into a funny story, like Arms and the Man, for example, or St. Joan, Back to Methuselah. I really think these two are immortal. Girish Karnad, among the Indian playwrights, I regard very highly, and Vijay Tendulkar. Girish translated his own plays into English, and so they're wonderful. Tendulkar, I wonder how much justice has been done to him by translators, because they end up literally translating instead of, you know, finding a new idiom. They're lazy a lot of the time. The job is already done for them, so all they have to do is convert it into a, the simplest Hindi they can. What I have been doing for the last 20 years now is stories on stage, starting with Ismat Suktai, who I discovered very late, and I can never stop kicking myself for it because I spent two months with her in Lucknow shooting Junoon. But that was the time when I was a method actor and I was involved in my part, you know, and I'd go on my head, <laughs> this ferocious Pathan all the time. <laughs> and Ismat Appa was the most gossipy <laughs> person I've ever met. And I wasn't interested in this conversations. But she would often corner me and start asking me about my family. And I'd get irritated and say, I don't want to talk about my family. No, he says, no, better, 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 better. And we are from, seem to be from very similar backgrounds. Uh, if you've ever read Isma Chukta, those backgrounds that she writes about, though she grew up in Jodhpur, and I lived a lot of my childhood in Ajmer, and in Merat, 
and I'm from a somewhat feudal family. And she often writes about such people. And I found her stories absolutely fascinating. I read them much later. She never once talked about herself. She never asked me if I'd ever read anything of her work or if I knew about her or anything. She didn't want to know because she could read me, you know. And I knew nothing about her except this, she's this very sweet old woman who's very cuddly. And But I'm not in the mood for cuddling grandma right now, you know. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm fighting for independence. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really uh, gain much out of that two months. And after she died, I walked into a bookshop once, and this was quite amazing. The first book I saw was a book of Ismat Chokhtai's story. It was staring at me, you know, like this. Okay, you have not read me yet. And I said, sorry, Ismat Abba. And I picked up the book and I read it. This was a bookshop called Danai, which, which is on Danda Road, which was, it's gone now. And uh, I picked up this book and I saw, and I could not put it down. It was in English translation. I never realized how bad the translation was until I read the originals. But even in that bad translation, I was just mesmerized. And I said, she's talking about me. She's talking about my family. I know this guy. I know this woman. I don't read Urdu as well as I read Hindi. So luckily she's been printed in Hindi as well. And I got hold of a book of short stories. And some of them were the ones I read in English. And I, the moment I read them, I said, this has to be done on stage. I can do it. Even Ratna, who supports me in everything I do, said, who's going to understand this language? Who's going to come and watch this? You telling a story. And I said, I don't care whether anybody comes to watch it or not. I have to do it. And so we got these three stories among the collection. And my daughter Hiba did one, Ratna did one, and I did one. And we opened this in 2001, and it's still alive. And every show we go is packed to the gills. And it is such fun. And after that, I did several other stories of hers. I did Manto's stories. I did Premchand's stories. I did Krishan Chandra's stories. Harishankar Parsai's stories. There was a writer called Kamta Nath who lived in Lucknow, who's passed away now. Then I did Jabran's The Prophet. I'm finding material. And not all written material is suitable to stage. But whatever I find suitable to stage, I do. I don't search through plays any longer because I just detest realism on stage, mm. you know, and, uh, you know, these drawing room with all the chairs facing the audience and a window where you can see the sky and, you know, radio playing. So I, I just detest this nonsense. Theatre is not meant to be real and it cannot be real. And the audience is never taken in that it's real. So I'd rather tell a story on stage. And that's what I've been doing. And uh, and all the stuff that I've read in the past is coming back to me. And I'm doing it. And at the moment, I'm, I'm involved in trying to stage parts of a book of letters which Fez Ahmed Fez and his wife wrote to each other when he was in prison. In the prison, he wrote some of his greatest poetry. And he and his wife, who was British, exchanged these letters. He wrote to her in Urdu. She could read Urdu and she replied back in English. And so the, play, the plan was to have the play partly in Urdu and partly in English. And I'm still working at it and I'll, I'll do it someday. Very nice. I had a question actually because I recently started reading Urdu poetry and I've been reading translations because I do not understand a lot of Urdu. So, but you said like translations lose a lot of meaning. Do you have certain recommendations? Of, Victor say, Kiernan. Victor Kiernan. K-I-E-R-N-A-N. Victor Kiernan was an Irishman who was a specialist in Farsi and Urdu and who taught at the Lahore University and was a close friend of Fez. Yeah. Uh, and you must read his translations. Books, I think, are available. It's written in Urdu and it's written in Roman. Do you read the alphabet, the Urdu alphabet at all? No, sir. I don't no? understand. <laughs> well, I suggest you learn it because uh, then it'll make a little more sense. Got it. Uh, and then there's Victor's translation of the verse both okay. in, in poetic meter and in prose. Gosh. Victor has done this to Halib's work and to Fez's work. And I really think that you should read that if you're interested in Urdu poetry. It'll, it'll hook you. I can promise you that. I'll do that. I actually started reading The Whale Suite by Aga Shahid Ali. And mm -hmm. he talks a lot about Fez. Yeah. And that's how I got back to reading Fez Ahmed Fez. Yeah. Yeah, Fez is 
the greatest after Ghalib. I also want to know, like, do you like to travel? Not much. <laughs> I, I like to get to another place, but I hate the traveling part of it. <laughs> so then I can ask this, which are those another places that like you really like going to like, or like in India, well, outside of India? In India, Kerala, all the hills. Um, we have a home in Masuri and I often go there. I haven't been there for some years, but I often do go there. And Kerala is a part of the country I love. Most other places I've been to once. I haven't felt the urge to go back. I've been to Ladakh. I think I'm a bit too old to go back there now. It's very tough, uh, but it's so beautiful. And um, the memorable places that I've been to are, I would say, uh, Mortugal, really memorable. It's very beautiful, uh, very nice people. The history of the Portuguese in India tells a different story, though. But uh, I don't know. I guess as conquerors, they had to, you know, swing the baton about a bit. But it's a beautiful country. And I really enjoyed being there. America, I've been to several times because, and England, because I worked there and we've often been invited to stage our plays there. And I have dear relatives and dear friends who live in both. Kind of used to both these places, New York and um, uh, London. They're, they're like coming home. Among the memorable places, I would place Egypt and Morocco. Malta is another place for its history and, and, and for the... Yeah, I, I just find these old, old remains of old buildings very fascinating. I don't know why. I haven't remembered any previous births. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was amazing, sir. Uh, is there anything that we might have missed from our end that you would like to talk about? I was asked recently who are my favorite writers. And I, I decided after thinking about it, it's a tie between Ismat Sukhtai and Anthony Burgess. I think Anthony Burgess and Woodhouse and uh, the, the Woodhouse often said Shakespeare's spelling is not very good and <laughs> his grammar is not up to par. <laughs> what is the, the most kindest, unkindest <laughs> and so on. But Shakespeare and um, England and War, who I've just discovered, are the greatest writers in, uh, in, in the English language. Ismat Apa, without a question. The greatest in Urdu, Manto, is hard on her heels. But Premchanji is, is beautiful. Premchanji wrote in Urdu. I was born soon after independence, you know, and as a child, one would listen to Akashwani, where the Samachar would be read by a gentleman called Dev Kinandan Pandey. And not a word of it was comprehensible. And then there was Radio Pakistan. So it was the biggest tragedy that happened, you know, that uh, uh, Urdu was declared the national language of Pakistan. There's a zillion other languages, beautiful languages uh, spoken in Pakistan. There's Punjabi to begin with. There's Baluchi, there's Saraiki, there is Dari, there is Pashto, there's Farsi, there's so many other languages. But uh, for political reasons, it became the... And, and since then, it's become a Muslim language, you know, which is bullshit. Primchand wrote in Urdu. Firak Gorakhpuri wrote in Urdu. All of Punjab read and wrote Urdu. The old timers in Punjab still read the Urdu newspaper. Mm -hmm. An actor like Dharmendra insists on his lines being written in Urdu, not in Hindi. And all the other old character actors, Jeevans and the, all these people, Madanpuri, they all wanted their script in Urdu. And now Urdu has become a foreign language. It's really funny. So a lot of Premchand's work, like a lot of Manto's work and some of Ismat Sultai's, the vocabulary has been changed from Urdu, difficult Urdu words into equally difficult Hindi words. And that's why the joy of reading Premchand is somewhat gone. And you have to look very hard to find, you know, what he actually wrote and not what some editor decided would be a better word. Yeah, these are my favorite writers. I think that's one question that you forgot. I'm sure you people watch a lot of stuff on YouTube. But the channel that I suggest you watch and recommend you watch is Chal Chitra Talk if you're into books and into movies. This is Nasiruddin Shah saying hello to everyone.